Ahoy, ahoy! Welcome back to another episode of Cultura Inglesa Podcast. Eu sou o Caio Copato. Eu sou o William Bueno. E? Pera. Espera, é câmera? Câmera? Tem câmera? É isso! Estamos de volta com uma nova temporada do Cultura Inglesa Podcast. E dessa vez, um novo formato. Estamos no YouTube. Agora vocês podem ver os nossos rostos e as nossas vozes em português e inglês. É. Lingual Podcast. Exactly. Amazing. A gente ficou aí, acho que uns três meses, né, preparando isso aí. Vocês que sentiram falta da gente lá no Spotify, agora podem também nos assistir. Pois é, espero não decepcionar muitas pessoas, né, exibindo aqui nossos rostos, mas estamos muito felizes de estarmos aqui estreando esse novo formato e espero que vocês gostem também. Hoje vamos conversar com o professor Marcel Young. Marcel Young, que é professor da unidade remota Advanced, entusiasta do esporte e um ávido participante do Cultura Inglesa Podcast. Marcel, bem-vindo ao nosso podcast. Valeu, Caio. Valeu, Bill. Isso aí. Fala, pessoal. É isso aí, cara. É uma honra, cara. Se eu pudesse fazer isso aqui todo dia, eu faria assim sem pensar duas vezes. Acho bem bacana. Obrigado pelo convite aí. Vamos, vamos lá. Vamos, vamos trocar uma ideia aí. Conversar bastante de diversos assuntos Polêmicos? Não. Polêmicos, não. É, não pode ter polêmicos. <risos> Mas é muito apropriado para esse primeiro episódio com esse formato a gente chamar o Marcel porque ele nos ajudou muito é, todos esses anos que a gente ficou no Spotify. O Marcel sempre lá é, sendo host, sendo guest também. Então, valeu mesmo aí por toda a sua ajuda sempre. Nós, é muito nós. legal tê-lo aqui com a gente. Isso aí, cara, gravando de casa, né? Começamos na, na, na pandemia, é né? Cada um no seu computador e... Uma hora um caía, e o outro é, travava, é, perdia e tentava tudo. juntar tudo. E agora a gente tá carros. nesse belo estúdio aqui, olha só, que glamour. Que gente, né? é. Exatamente, diretamente aqui do 121 Studios. Obrigado aí, pessoal, pessoal da técnica ali, ó. Tá atrás da câmera, vocês estão vendo? A gente tá vendo, a gente descreve aqui tudo pra vocês. Isso aí, Marcel, a gente queria muito fazer esse convite pra você. Você vai ser sempre um cara que apoiou muito uhum. o podcast. E... Além de né, um participante frequente do podcast, você é um professor muito experiente. Quantos anos de cultura inglesa, Marcel? De cultura, acho que 14 anos eu completo esse ano. Quem diria, né? Achei que fosse durar Quase um ano. do Bill. Achei que fosse durar um ano. <risos> <risos> eu lembro até hoje, quando eu, quando eu entrei na cultura, acho que né, pela, pela carga e todas as responsabilidades, eu, no meu primeiro ano, eu falei, nossa, não sei se eu vou aguentar isso aqui. Não. E aí elas se foram... 14 anos, né? Então, o tempo passa mesmo. Maravilha. Nossa, legal. Então, Marcel, você deve conhecer bem o Telling the News. Você Telling já the deu news. aula para Young Learners? Já, já. Muitos. Tudo bem. Uh, é. O nosso programa aqui nesse novo formato começa uhum. com essa experiência Telling the News. Ô, ô Bill, você quer explicar para o nosso público? Se você, é <risos> se você já foi nosso aluno, quando você era criancinha, fazia lá Kids, Junior, Stars... Sempre a aula começava com telling the news, então tinha ali um brinquedo, um ursinho, alguma coisa, passava o ursinho aqui, como que foi a sua semana, e você falava sobre a sua semana, é o que a gente vai fazer aqui. Então você vai fazer as honras, Marcelo, a gente passa o Lion pra você. Legal. Você é a outra vez, vamos lá. Vamos lá, Vou colocar o Lion aqui. Bom, telling the news, eu acho que pela primeira vez em anos eu consegui maratonar três séries em... Três meses. Eu sei que pra muita gente isso não é nada, né? Tem gente que maratona três séries, mas eu acho que uma coisa que, como eu acho que já mencionei, eu tô, eu tô eu trabalho, né? Acho que trabalho de professor, né? Cultura inglesa, então muitas aulas, muitas responsabilidades. Também eu tenho duas filhas, cachorros, então realmente é, é difícil você conseguir sentar no sofá e, bom, agora eu vou assistir uma série, né? Vou assistir, opa, mais de um episódio, dois, três episódios, uma tacada só. Difícil. Né? E eu, eu consegui, cara, eu tô muito orgulhoso, né? São três séries aí que é, a gente pode até conversar delas a respeito. Uma é o, a série americana chamada The Bear, né? O Urso. São acho que duas temporadas. Uma aqui, outra do Guy Ritchie, um diretor inglês. Se vocês já se conhecem. É, e tem tudo a ver com o tema de hoje é, também, né? Que é essa mais série chamada The Gentleman, né? Em português eles traduziram para... Adoro essas traduções para português, né? Qual que é? O mag, os Magnatas do Crime. Puxa, né? bem parecida. <risos> Não, e cavalheiro. É, ué, é. Mas, mas eu gostei. É. Eu gostei. E uma outra chamada The, uh, The Mayor of Kingston, né? Que é uma série americana também. Eu The acho Mayor. 
The Mayor. Então, acho até, mayor. Acho até legal essa coisa da, da pronúncia. Ou oh, The Mayor. É, eu, eu, quando eu aprendi a, a pronúncia, eu, eu sempre falei The Mayor. The Mayor of Kingston. E a coisa que eu, que eu até prestei atenção na série, que eles não falam Mayor. Of Kingston, eles estavam falando Mayor, mayor. Of, mayor of Kingston. Consegui maratonar, assim, eu, 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 eu me sinto capaz de debater com os alunos agora. Show de bola, então. Show de bola. Manteve foco ali, Manteve por foco. várias horas. O foco, disciplina. Legal, legal. Passe a bola aqui para o Bill, então. Olá, Bill. O, o, o Bill agora está com o Lion. É, cara, se for para falar dessa semana aqui, você tem duas, três coisas que eu fiz bastante... É, bem, as duas que eu mais fiz foi tomar água e passar repelente. É, <risos> em alguns momentos eu quase confundi, inclusive, perigoso. Porque eu sou homem, não consigo fazer duas coisas ao mesmo tempo. Então, assim, cuidado. É, na verdade, agora começou a chover, então acho que vai piorar essa coisa do mosquito, né? Mas o calor também diminuiu. É, então já dá uma ajuda aí também, mas continue tomando água, viu? Você que tá assistindo aí, toma água agora, inclusive. E a outra, terceira coisa, claro, pensar nesse momento aqui. A gente tava muito ansioso. Ansiedade boa, né? Não ansiedade ruim. E muito legal que chegou esse momento. E é isso. Agora, Caião. Legal. Laia sempre quis segurar. <risos> o Laia. Eu acho que muito parecido com o que o Bill falou aqui. Acho que nessa semana a gente teve muitas reuniões. Essa semana, semana passada, a gente passou muito tempo aí discutindo inovações para cultura, inovações para o podcast. Então foi uma semana, assim, bastante estressante, mas de forma positiva, né? Aquela, aquele estresse, né? Aquela ansiedade de estar aqui logo falando com vocês, estando nesse novo formato. E é isso, e aqui estamos. Show de bola. Show de Marcel bola. Marcel Young. Marcel. Show de bola. Esse aqui é seu. Obrigado. Tá? Um presente aqui do Muito nosso obrigado. Aê. Marta, Aê. tá ali, ó, no outro lado. Aí sim. Obrigado, tá mas ela tá ali. Aê. Leva pra casa o Lion. Legal. O episódio de hoje, pessoal, a gente vai falar de sotaques. Diferentes sotaques em inglês. Então, se você gosta do assunto, se você se interessa, se você já está curtindo esse novo formato, deixa o like aí no nosso vídeo, tá? Para dar aquela força, impulsionar e mais pessoas conhecerem o nosso projeto nessa nova fase. Daqui em diante, guys, a nossa conversa vai ser 100% in English, tá? Então, a gente vai bater o papo aqui em inglês. Então, se vocês precisarem de auxílio, já ativa aqui a legenda do YouTube... Já ativa o Closed Caption para dar aquele suporte. E vocês que querem um desafio maior, vocês vão poder escutar esse episódio lá no Spotify. Sem imagens, da maneira como vocês sempre escutaram, para vocês manterem aquela prática em dia. Ok? Very well. So, well. accents. English accents from around the world. Marcel, you lived in London, am yes. I right? Yes. Can you tell us a little bit of your experience, especially regarding the... British accent. Is yes. there is there such a thing? The British accent? Yes, there is such a thing, but um, one uh, curious fact about my uh, learning career is that uh, before I lived in, in London, when I was 16, I actually lived in the US for a year. I lived in a small town called um, Monroe. It's kind of like 20 minute drive from Detroit, very close to Canada as well. So they have this very particular accent, right? So. It was funny because I, I lived there for a year, so obviously I picked up some some of their accent. I have, you know, and then uh, years later, I, well, I came back to Brazil and uh, kept studying English here in Brazil. And then, I don't know, 10, 10 years later, I decided to go to London, right? So when I went to London, uh, not that I had an American accent because I'm not American, but people kept asking me like, oh, What, what, what's up with your accent? Because it was quite different from, from their accent, right? And it was funny because having lived in, in the UK for so many years, sometimes I call my host family, right? Back in the US, you know, just to see how they're doing. And whenever I talk to them now, uh -huh. they kind of come in, oh, you got a funny accent now. Wh when did you go British, yeah, right? I mean... <laughs> Because you're not, we can see that you're not British because you're not British, but you got some hints of British accent now. So it's kind of weird. So this is how it works. When I talk to an American person, yeah, he or she always say, oh, okay, because you got some hints, you know, of, of British accent and then vice versa, right? So yeah. it is quite interesting, but there is such a thing. Um, but I think most people have, I wouldn't say a misled idea of, Because 
people generalize, right? Because they say, especially the students, they, oh, Marcel, I, I like the American accent or I like the British accent, right? And whenever they make this kind of comment, my reaction is always like, I always ask them a question. What kind of American accent? Sure. Yeah. And, oh, so you like British accent. So which one of them? Yeah. Yeah. True. And yeah. they kind of like, what do you mean? Which one? I say, well, because, and then I, okay, let's open a new whiteboard here. Let's start with the history. Yeah. Let's start, let's start with some geography lessons here. <laughs> right. So what do you understand by British? And then I, you know, talk about all the, the Great Britain, United Kingdom thing, right? Because uh, most of them are, most of them are kind of unaware of this. You know, they, they, they know the existence of England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland, right? But they actually don't, they don't actually know what Great Britain is and what the United Kingdom is, right? Yeah, that's, that's a that's, very, very common uh, trouble people have, yeah, right? Yeah. Well, what is the difference between the, the Great Britain and the United Kingdom? Yeah, uh, I always start with, okay, so this is England, right? Uh, we're think of London, right? The capital is London, and then uh, uh, Oxford, right? Cambridge, Manchester, Liverpool, especially if you like football, right? Think about the football teams, <laughs> there's yeah. Liverpool, Manchester, yes, what else? Leicester, right? And Brighton. So this is England, right? And then right next to England, there's another country, which is Wales, right? So if you're born in Wales, you are Welsh. Uh, the capital is... Uh, Cardiff. Cardiff, right? Thank you. And then if you go up north, there is Scotland, right? Capital is Edinburgh. If you're born in Scotland, you are Scottish. So these three countries, uh, also known as the Big Island, they form the Great Britain, right? So whenever you, you see like the acronym GB, right? So... Uh, we, we now have the Olympic Games uh, coming up, right, in, in July. Mm -hmm. And there is an interesting thing is that they don't compete as individual countries. <laughs> they compete as Team GB, GB. Great Britain, right? Which is very convenient for them because they have convenient. Yes. athletes from different countries. Yes. yes. Which I think it's a brilliant idea because we actually I think we could do that in football, right? I'm just like this. Join Argentina now, come on. <laughs> no, maybe not. don't even joke about it. Maybe not. <laughs> a joke. So it was a joke, guys. But if you get Great Britain, which is the big island, plus all the small isles like Isle of Man, Isle of Wight, and Northern Ireland, which I had the pleasure to uh, visit with my colleague here, Caio, right? So yeah, that's awesome. We, we've been to Northern Ireland. We could have an episode about that. One we day. could. Yeah, we could. We could. We will. Yeah, just, um, okay, Great Britain, all the small isles and and Northern Ireland, they comprise what we know as the United Kingdom. Okay. So whenever we refer to as something's British, a British person or a British accent could be an English accent, it could be a Scottish accent or a Welsh accent or Northern Irish accent. Right? Fantastic. And then if you think about the English accent, right? Let's say because each city, each town in, in England has like a very unique accent, <laughs> right? Yes. Very. Yeah. So there's not there, there's not even such a thing as an English accent yeah, because yeah, within English England accent, you have the different right. accents as well. Yeah, right. Because if you think about, for example, let, let me pick two celebrities. Uh, one is Adele, right, the singer. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, not her singing, but her like talking. Yes. Mm -hmm. For many years, I thought that she had what we known as the Cockney accent. It, it, isn't that the Cockney? Technically, no, because she wasn't born in uh, East London. She's not from East London. Okay, so the Cockney is is an accent. Originally, historically, okay. you know, there is um, there is this part of the city from part, part of, of the, the city. city. Yes, like here in São Paulo, we have uh, like different accents in São Paulo. We often say that. Yeah, right. We have the Mazaropi accent, <laughs> right, which is the, the the people from the countryside. Uh -huh. We have the Mano Brau, right, which is galera, <laughs> né, from the Quebrada, and Bossa. Paulistano ali, meu, faria lime. So, so the same thing happens in London. Yeah, yes. Oh, yes. interesting. I, I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, but it used, yes. to, be, it used to be something right? related to socioeconomic class because there was this church, I forgot the name of the church, which is on the, uh, on the east side of London. And there were the bells of the church, right? The bowl bells. And historically, in the old days, whoever could hear 
the bells uh, were considered Cockney because they lived in that particular area of London. Okay. And uh, they were like predominantly uh, white, uh, blue collar workers. And I'm sorry, the, the word, the term Cockney, where, where does it come from? I think I think that's, it refers to the area. Yes, the area. Okay. Or to the people who lived in there or the people who were from that area. Yes. Right? Funny. And that's it. So, uh, but you know what, these things have changed, you know, because you, you know, you got like different generations, right? And uh, Adele, uh, if you look at her accent, there's a, something very, very similar to Cockney. Okay. It could be even considered Cockney, but technically speaking, she's not a, she's not a Cockney, right? Okay, but it's something quite similar. I've used her as an example of what Cockney English might sound, and it's it's quite it's quite common. There's uh, many students um, say, "Oh, but Marcel, I'm going to London," and you know, and they start like interacting with locals, like taxi drivers and cashiers, and the first time they encounter someone with this Cockney accent. Uh, the interaction becomes kind of blurry because they don't understand what people are saying. Because we, it is not something that we normally see in course books, for example. Now now that you mentioned that, I think that part of this uh, generalization of American accent and British accent is also partly our fault as teachers. You know, I'm not seeing like the three... I, I, I was going to say that. Because uh, when you have... Um, I'll give an example. I'm pretty sure uh, most teachers have been through that and, and even students... You have this very basic group, like beginner, absolute beginners. And then you uh, sometimes we just get the course book. And for example, we're teaching um, basic words, right? Like school objects, for example. And then, okay, so let's repeat. All right, so pencil. And then, for example, imagine you say eraser, right? But then when the student listens to the official audio, let's say the CDs that we had in the past. Uh, yeah. uh, but teacher, uh, the, he said uh, eraser or rubber, if yeah. it's like the British book. And then we say, ah, okay, because this is the British accent. So British English, you don't pronounce the R like at the end of words or mm-hmm. not before another vowel or something like that. So rubber and then American would be rubber. Ah, so that's why we have like Harry Potter and Harry Potter or water and water. And, and this is interesting because this is kind of like a ground rule, but not for necessarily British accent. accent. This is what we call RP. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, RP stands for received pronunciation. So what is that? This is the authentic original English pronunciation. Also so, known as the, the BBC English. Right? <laughs> exactly. So RP is like, let's say, that is kind of like the ground zero for English pronunciation, modern English pronunciation. Yeah. So when we say, okay, you don't pronounce the R, for example, pota, water, something like that, and the the, the strong T and everything, uh, this is RP. It's not, I I mean, it is somehow British accent, but as you said, there are tons of British accents within Great Britain. But it's important to acknowledge that the original, let's say, accent, the original pronunciation of English is like that. So the R, in this case, for example, shouldn't be pronounced. And then, obviously, uh, just a reminder, the UK, if you think about the territory, the area, you could fit the whole United Kingdom inside the state of Sao Paulo. Yeah. As far as area is concerned. So we're we're talking about a very small territory, at least for Brazilian standards. Uh, yeah. And you have this universe, this multitude of different accents. So it's, it's really crazy, right? It's really crazy. Huh? Bill, I have a question for you. I've been thinking about it. Since I, I heard it from Marcel, how do you spell Lester? L. Uh, well, if you're talking about the Beekman uh, assistant, right? I mean, <laughs> only only old people will get that. It's the football team. It's the Red. So it's L E I C E S T E R. Am I right? Is he right? I don't know. I didn't pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. No, no, no. It's because when I said Beekman, man, Marcel was transported <laughs> to his childhood. You know, like, like, really like no, yeah, oh like, man, is it Beekman. my turn? Well, oh, yeah. Okay, just, I'm not listening to you. Not immediately related to accent, but it's something that I think it's very culture. Right, because uh, when it comes to uh, words in what we call British English, we have many examples of these words that they sound nothing like the way they yeah, last spell Gloucester, right? Gloucester, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like Shire, isolated word, Shire. Yeah. But then it's sure if it's a suffix, like yeah. Leicestershire, for yeah. example, yeah. Leicestershire. Or Worcestershire, the sauce. Worcestershire, the Worcestershire, sauce. Worcestershire, sauce. Yeah. Worcestershire sauce. And when you think of word formation, yeah. right, you, you assume that, that that word would be pronounced shire, 
Because Shire is the name of a, a small village, right? Oh, uh, inhabited by hobbits, yes. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. But my, my point here is, uh, I think it's our fault as teachers, but not, not just teachers, but because materials, <clears throat> dictionaries, right? If you go to dictionary, you're going to have their British English and American English, yeah. right? So I think that we, we, we make a point clear that when we say there, there's no such a thing as American accent or yeah. British accent, we are going deeper, right? There is no standard uh, British accent or no standard American accent, but there are characteristics of American pronunciation and British pronunciation. Yeah, definitely. You, you like the R sound, right? Yeah. The R definitely. sound at the end of words uh, is something very uh, American, right? Like I make a joke in the beginning of the episode with Marcel saying mayor, yeah, right? Yeah. And then that's something very American to say, right? Yeah. Yes, because we can't just categorize accent into two like two separate boxes right there aren't just okay the american and the british right going back to for example um if you are in, in a city like london for example right you could think about i don't know dozens of different accents yes not only the cockney not only the rp if you think about for example um people who uh have come from caribbean countries for example Right, Jamaica and yes, they call the uh, the West Indies, right? And they have a very particular uh, accent, right? And and then you you got all the uh, the the mixed accents, right? People who like you know came from different countries and then got married and then have kids, right? So mm -hmm. uh, yes, there is a there is this huge variety of accents within London, okay? And then you go to other cities in the UK, like Birmingham and uh, Newcastle and Manchester, right? I've heard, I've heard, uh, once I talked to a guy from London, he said he could understand people from uh, uh, Newcastle, like the, because they, they got the... Geordie, Geordie, Geordie accent. accent. The Geordie accent, right? Man, now I'm feeling really relieved yeah. because, you know, I don't have many traveling anecdotes uh, like my friends do here. Yeah. You'll see that during our next episodes. But uh, one of one of the few places that I visited, like abroad, was Newcastle. Uh, I got there on a Tuesday evening. It was like, I don't know, minus 50. No, I'm joking, but it was really cold, man. And I had uh, chapped lips. Uh, like I was, I was literally bleeding, man. It, it was like bleeding. And then I was like, okay, so is there a drugstore here where I can get some, you know, uh, lip balm? Hey, thank you. And it's like boots, right? It's very yeah, yeah, big yeah. there. The, uh, and and then the the reception is the hostel reception is gave me the directions, and I I couldn't understand them. But but I mean, obviously there is also something that I should mention is that I usually don't get directions uh, in Portuguese either because I'm really terrible with this, you know, like uh, like sense of direction and everything. <laughs> People stop talking and then you just forget, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, because I'm, yeah, and I'm really bad. Thank you. Yeah, I'm like, That's okay, I, I heard something about turning left. Yes, and then uh, and then I ventured into the night. I mean, it was like pitch black. Uh, everything was closed and it was like 5 p.m. Uh, but that's what happens in Newcastle uh, during winter. It's a very, yeah. very small town, again, for Brazilian standards. I found the drugstore eventually, but I don't even know how because I did. I definitely didn't follow her directions. Then obviously you feel bad because like, man, you know, I should be getting what this girl is saying. But see, even people from London sometimes cannot get this Geordie accent, right? Yeah. It's very strange very strong they are near scotland yes and you know it's very different right? I, I think we all have funny stories regarding accents right i remember when i was backpacking in the united kingdom i i stayed at this hostel in glasgow and scotland and uh, for for those of you who've never been to scotland they have a very very strong accent uh -huh. yeah okay. and uh, the the girl from the front desk she asked me three or four times for something as soon as I was checking in. And I was like, I'm sorry, come again. Could you repeat, please? You name it, other similar expressions, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and then she she enunciated like very positively, like, do you have your passport on you? And I, like, I was like so embarrassed. But that was not the <laughs> worst part. The last part it was I stayed in Glasgow for like two or three nights. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, very small hostel. And whenever I went to the cafeteria or some other facilities inside the 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 hostel, this girl, she was always chasing me and 
she was like murmuring things that I, I, I couldn't understand. I know she was flirting with me. And she was like, yeah. you know, offending me somehow. I was just like nodding. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I hope she was, right? Uh, and I mean, that, that was not so long ago. Uh, I, when, I, when I was there, I had been an English teacher for at least uh, almost a decade. <laughs> so it's a very common thing to happen, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think accents, they, are, they grow on you, right? I mean, at first, they're shocking. But as time goes by... You, you start to become familiar and say, oh, okay, I, I start to understand what you're saying. It's all about exposure, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. What about you, Marcel? Do you have any funny stories involving accents? No, no, I'm not sure if it's funny, but I once was, I was, I was living in London and I, I had a friend. Uh, it was like staying with me for a few days. We were about to go uh, backpacking and uh, we went to this uh, cafe, right? And, um, I said, oh, okay, let, let me order because I want to practice my English. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yes, as hard as yours, man. <laughs> okay. And then he ordered like a couple of uh, cups of coffee and something to eat. And and then the the, um, the girl at, at, at the counter, she was like, oh, uh, it ain't here or take away. That's, that's how she, it ain't here or take away. And he was like, no, two coffees. <laughs> <laughs> He goes, yeah, yeah, but you're a takeaway. And he would look at me, I was like, yeah, go ahead. Man. Sugar. Yes. Sugar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, but uh, she had this very strong accent. She was uh she was she was a Londoner, right? Uh I can't I can't do Cockney accent, unfortunately. I, I wish I could. I, I've tried many times, but you know, they they speak very fast and they don't and don't say the words the way we expect, right? For example, they we were talking about like water in English, uh, American English, water and water, right? They sometimes they say water, water, mm -hmm. what you want, ma? Yes. So, and then instead of saying my, they say me. Yes. What is my car? Yeah. Oh, I forgot my keys. So imagine someone who's not used to their accent, right? Mm -hmm. And then he looked quite out, like, oh, Marcel, can you just step in and <laughs> help me out here? I was like, what? Oh. All right, then let's go. But yeah, this, this is not, it's not, it didn't happen to me, but this is something quite common to people because, again, people are so used to this classroom English. Yes. That when it goes to the real world, right? Yes. You know, and the same goes for, for example, American English, right? And people say, oh, no, because I prefer the American. Uh, no, uh, one comment that students always make is that, oh, I find it easier to understand American English. And I was like, okay, uh, have you watched a series called The Wire? Because it's set, set, yeah. it's set in, in Baltimore, right? Yeah. And, okay, so try watching a few episodes of it. Yes. Okay. Especially the, 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 the members of, of, of the street gangs talking to each other, right? It's a very particular accent. The kind of accent that even, I mean, I know someone, someone from New York or someone from Texas wouldn't be able to understand. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. This kind of variations in there that I find really, really interesting. And I, I personally don't think, guys, that's our... You mentioned being our, the teacher's fault, right? I don't know. I'm not sure if, it, if if that can be considered our fault. Because it's not something that we do deliberately, right? So, yeah. No. I, th I think it, it comes from mm, source material sometimes, yeah. right? Sometimes it, you need to work with that source material, like Bill mentioned, like audios from course books... And then uh, many of them do not, uh, you know, uh, offer a variety of accents. They are like very uh, standard, even for logistic reasons. I mean, it must be really hard to bring people from different parts of the world to record material. Yes. But, but I'll say something that might be a, a bit uh, unusual. Uh, I would like to know from you, fellow teachers, if you agree. But... As far as uh, something beneficial to our students, I often tell mine that it is important to get exposure not only from, you know, British, American, Canadian accents, but other English accents as well, like Indian accent or South African, Chinese people speaking English. 
non right? so it would be Japanese yes people. non-native non-native yeah. uh yes when we think about and and this has been like over a decade I, I've, I've been telling my students look if you are focusing on English for business for example the chances of you dealing with people from India you know Asian countries uh, even a few European countries like Germany are much higher so you're gonna be dealing with you know more people whose uh, English is not their first language than the uh, the other way around so uh, I, I think it's much more useful let's say to focus on the way these people pronounce the uh, words or like their accents because you know if you think about it like like we were talking about the size of the UK for example uh-huh. the chances of you actually dealing with British people like native it, it, they are very slim nowadays everyone everyone is interacting with Indian and, and Chinese people you know like so yeah. uh, and and I, I just very quickly I want to mention because I was looking at this book here look you were talking about materials and in our upper three upper intermediate course uh, in general but we have this partnership with National Geographic I remember there is a listening exercise in this book about the food industry uh, it's about news re- uh, involving controversy in the food industry and one of the oh, reporters scares. Health scares? No? I'm thinking about something. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, it's like uh, scandals and, and everything. And, oh, and, 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 and scandal, one man. of the audios is South African, man. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a reporter that talks about a guy who used to put a cockroach into his food in restaurants. Uh, yeah. So he would get free I meals. That. And the fine, he's fined in, I don't remember how many thousand rand. Rand is the South yeah, African I currency. I the way he, uh, like, I, I think it's funny because every time I play these audio, students are like shocked at the accent. And then they're like, teacher, what is that and then I'm like, okay, this is South the, the typical again South South African accent. Uh, so this is very interesting. I think National Geographic, since we've partnered up to produce the materials, I think that they have this concern. Uh, we have lots of different accents, including French, for example, people yeah. even non-native. How do you deal with that in the classroom, Marcel? Like when students they are shocked, they it, it's a very common uh, yeah, reaction. That's... Oh my God, teacher, what a terrible accent! Is it? Well, <laughs> I said, well, um, I think it's it's a really nice to align students' expectations when it comes to accents. Because some, some of them expect to, oh, in a few years' time, I will be able to understand every single accent, right? That is thrown at me. So, and then when, uh, and then I kind of like humorously tell them, right? That, oh, you would never be able to understand uh, all accents in the world. And I give some of my, exa- my examples, right? When, for example, we went to Belfast, right? We, uh, we found ourselves in situations of course, we went to the market to buy some food, for example, right? We we didn't just want to communicate, oh, we want to buy this, thank you very much. We want to kind of have some conversations with the cashier, with, with the bartender, whatever. Yeah. As the interaction progresses, I think that it gets harder and harder to understand them because as soon as they see, they see that we can understand them, they kind of like, okay, I will speak the way I speak to my friends. <laughs> yep. I don't need to, like, yeah, tone it down. To, I don't need to, <laughs> uh, to I don't need to grade my language, right? I don't need to slow down. And then when things get quite emotional, right? Because then we feel kind of, oh my God, what is he talking about, right? So I use my own examples to illustrate to students that you always find yourself in situations in which you can't understand what the other, people say, the other person is saying. Yeah, because if you go to New Zealand, for example, right? I used to work with a guy from from New Zealand from a uh, they called kiwi, not because of the food, because of the bird. Every time he said something, I can have to kind of okay, these are the key words. <laughs> He's probably talking about football. Uh-huh. He's making a joke <laughs> about Brazil, and uh, he said something because I couldn't understand what he said. And I worked with him like for a year and a half. And in the same company, there was a guy from Australia. And I think he was from Perth, right? So he was not from the okay, places where most people go, for example, on yeah. the exchange programs like yeah. Sydney, yeah. Melbourne. West Australia. Yeah, he's like the other side of Australia. So they have a very unique accent as well. So his name was Duncan. So imagine myself talking to Duncan and Terry. Duncan from Perth and Terry from... I don't remember, which it was a small town in New Zealand. So imagine like the three of us having a conversation alongside with some Polish guys, some Brazilian guys. <laughs> so it was this melting pot of accents. And yeah. And there I I had to kind of create this strategy, Kyle, that you know, that you don't have to understand everything. Yeah. 
And this is something I try to like teach students. You won't be able to understand everything, but okay, what kind of strategies can you apply, can you use when communicating with people? Excellent. I think yeah. it's something we do naturally in Portuguese. We automatically filter everything yeah. we hear in Portuguese. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't need to pay attention to every single word you're saying, right? Uh, I just need to, you just need to get the message across, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think it's interesting what you mentioned about this, uh, this accent thing, because one of the reasons why we decided to start with this theme, right, this topic for the first episode is because we have this myth or this belief that at Cultura Inglesa we teach uh, British English, right? Yeah. And as I said, National Geographic, uh, our partnership is proof that we are much more concerned with global English and everything. But obviously students, they have this impression. So sometimes they say, teacher, but you, like when they ask me, for example, teacher, your English is not British, your, your English is American, right? You're it's American fraud. English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, no, but then I say no, but... but like teacher, your English British English or American? I'm like, no, my English is like Tatuapé English because uh, <laughs> to like, pick what an English. Yeah, I, I've been to I've been abroad just a couple of times. I uh -huh. I didn't have the experience, for example, as you did, like living there. I, I'm not pretentious to say, okay, you know, my English is American. Of course, when I was like shaping my accent. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, growing up and and or growing older in my case, but like you know, learning everything and. Uh, shaping, as I said, my accent, the way I spoke, obviously I had much more influence of American English, obviously. Sure. Yeah. But I cannot say, I, I cannot be pretentious enough to say, yes, this is American English, because I, I, I'm not American. You're not American. And I don't think an American would yeah. mistake me for one. Yeah. Yeah. So if you say like, ah, oh, yeah, I have American English, okay, did you grow up there? Or were you surrounded or raised by people who actively spoke native American English? Otherwise, man, I'm sorry, it's going to yeah, be like Baja Funda English. That's why at the beginning of the, at the, at the, beginning of the pod, I, I mentioned that I, people mentioned that I had hints of British. Exactly. I, I even I even wrote this down, man. I love this. Hints of British English. Exactly. We have hints of American yes. English for fantastic. Just like you, I'm not pretending to say, oh, my accent is British. No. I absolutely yeah. love this, man. That just said. And this is something that I think people, my opinion, okay, people should accept because you're a Brazilian. You were born in Brazil and you have English as a second language. And I do think that people I love accents. I love paying attention to accents. But I do think that people oftentimes worry too much about accents. They do. Yeah, excessively. And then, of course, that if you can choose. I mean, you can... Yeah. Okay, Pick I'm, your favorite. Yeah. Definitely. I'm Try not, to emulate. Like, it's yeah. okay. I'm not going to say elevator. I'm going to say lift. It, it's just like a, a detail to your uh, discourse. Yeah. It's not going to be... And I mean, all in all, right, we all speak English with a Brazilian accent, yeah. right? Because your accent is part of your cultural heritage, right? It's part of who you are. So Marcel's got some hints of uh, British English when he enunciates the words. Bill and I, we have this uh, uh, hints of uh, American English because we grew up uh, watching sitcoms and uh, Saturday Night Live, right? So it's part of who we are, right? It's part of our background, right? Yeah. And again, it would be totally incorrect to affirm that we teach one variety of accent. That's not the purpose. Cultura Inglesa is an institution that intends to promote the English culture in Brazil, right? So how, how not do necessarily you, how, how, as, a lingua, as a lingua franca. As a lingua franca. But how do you guys teach something when you know that there is a variety of ways of, of different ways of pronouncing it? How, how, do, how do you go about that? It, 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 there is a word. Okay, you have to teach then, right? You're going mm -hmm. to drill with that. You're going to practice with them. And, and, but you know that there are various ways of pronouncing it. How do you, how do you cope? For example, I, I had these situation yesterday uh, i had to word teach the word well i say it category yeah category but you can also category. say category so how do you how do you go about that do you just teach one way or do you mention like okay you can also most of the times i wait until someone asks me okay okay you know so so it's not too much uh -huh. but teacher 
can I also say mm -hmm. yes? Fair enough. That's that's yeah. how I go about it. What? Yeah, and I, I always like to give a few examples so I don't have to stop at every similar word. So laboratory or lab laboratory, uh, yeah. laboratory, yeah. secretary, secretary. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Exactly. And then I try to Some say, okay, so right? that, uh, you have this. <laughs> that advertisement and advertisement. Advertisement, advertisement exactly. And, and the one that always... Leisure like, and leisure. No, the one that shocks students is that schedule. Schedule. And schedule. schedule. Exactly. <laughs> Whenever you say schedule, they're like, oh, teacher, are you joking? Celtic, man? Celtic. And I was like... Boston Celtic. Yeah. Nobody says that. Celtic. And I, I was, I was just like, okay, I heard, okay, I used to have a boss. He was a well-educated, born and bred in whatever, Oxford. And he used to say schedule. So, yeah, believe me. <laughs> it stuck with you, right? Probably. Yeah. yeah. Guys, so to wrap things up. Yes. Uh... <laughs> Pieces of advice we would offer our learnings regarding accents, right? So, Marcel, please. Remember the series I was talking about, The Gentleman? Watch it. You can do it twice. Watching with English subtitles, subtitles in English and with no subtitles. The language is so unique. Because you're talking about like the British aristocracy, right? And if you like accents, a mixture of sophisticated with like gangster kind of language, I do recommend watching this uh, the series. So, um, and this is a, this is a habit that everybody should should have, okay? Because I don't know if I have time, but just watching series doesn't make anybody fluent. Doesn't matter. But working with the subtitles and really pay attention to what people are saying. Okay, I know that sometimes we just want to watch something and. <laughs> entertain ourselves but do it how can I say I can't <laughs> yeah I mean <laughs> focus get a, get a study pen, oriented get ways. a pen or pencil take yes. notes of words and how they pronounce things and go back rewind a little bit watch it again yes so this is uh, something Be curious that right? I recommend yeah. okay so the gentleman by Guy Ritchie guys not easy to understand great challenge awesome Bill, what's your recommendation? I just want to say something before. Uh, this topic that you're talking about, how to study, but at the same time be entertained, you can search on YouTube, Cultura Inglesa Talks, because we have an episode. It's 15 minutes long, and we talk exactly about the techniques that you can apply to watching stuff without or with subtitles, oh, taking notes or not. Yeah. We talk a lot about this, and it's 100% in Portuguese. Uh, I have uh, three very quick musical recommendations, okay? Because uh, another question that we, we could actually talk about this during a whole new episode, why don't uh, most singers sing with a British accent? Because like, okay, so for example, the Beatles, right? They have the Scouse accent, which uh -huh. is a Liverpool accent. But when they sing, the accent disappears. And this is the same for practically every other artist. Uh, the justification is that the way you sing and the metrics of, of music and stuff, American English favors this, the flow of the lyrics and everything. That's why. But I have three recommendations of artists who maintain, they, they preserve their, their uh, accent when they sing, okay? So the first one is The Streets. This is a, actually it's a rapper, uh, it's a project by uh, Mike Skinner, and he has this very strong London accent leaning towards Mockney. And when we talk about Mockney, uh, uh, sorry, Cockney, right? I'm sorry. Right. We have the Mockney accent, which is like a person emulating a Cockney accent, but the person doesn't necessarily have that accent. And a great example is a singer called Kate Nash, uh, Kate Nash, she has this song, uh, Foundation, uh, which is a great example of this. You can oh, I know hear. this song. I know this song. Yeah. Right. And, and Kate Nash was, uh, she played in Brazil, invited by the Cultura Inglesa Festival in 2013, uh, 11 years ago. She was the main attraction. And in 2016, three years later, Cultura Inglesa brought the Kaiser Chiefs. And Kaiser Chiefs is a, a rock band that when they sing, if you want to hear to... Uh, a song that displays this is uh, I Predict a Riot. You can hear a uh, perfect, like, uh, the, the perfect Birmingham accent. It's uh, Brummy, right? I took Brummy, yeah. And, uh, sorry, it's the Yorkshire accent because they are from Leeds, okay? Mm, okay? And also, sorry, the Streets, the rapper, yeah, there is a song called Weak Become Heroes, all right? So this is the best song to hear uh, his accent. That's it. Awesome. To you. Awesome. Well, my recommendation goes more in the sense of uh, 
advising students not to be over concerned about accent, right? So stop worrying about your accent. Remember that your accent is part of who you are and you should be proud of your history. You should be proud of your nationality or of where you came from, right? Your accent emulating, trying, pretending to be someone who you're not, is not going to improve the quality of your English and it's not going to make you a better person. So just accept, right? People, they have different accents. So do you, so do we here, right? Of course, you like a specific accent. You, you, you think it's pretty. You want to make your English more consistent with that accent. Go for it, right? I'm not stopping you. Nobody here is going to advise you against it, but it should not be a problem, okay? And as everyone is making recommendations of series and, and TV shows, uh, I'll have to recommend a TV series called Dairy Girls, because as you all know, I love the Irish culture. So if you want to hear the sound of that beautiful accent, I recommend that TV series. It's also very funny. Go watch it. <laughs> E agora chegou a hora do nosso quadro How Do You Say. É um clássico já do nosso podcast, no qual a gente vai analisar algumas palavras, algumas expressões que a gente mencionou aqui na nossa conversa e a gente vai tentar explicar para você, querido telespectador. Então a gente vai aqui fazer uma rodada explicando para vocês né, a, o uso né, e o significado de alguns desses termos. Marcel, nessa conversa aqui, alguém usou, acho que foi o Bill, falou que ele had chap lips. Explica pra gente aí que significa que lips, que lips. Bom português era o lábio rachado, né? Você tá, tá com frio, lábio rachado, e aí é, você pode usar aquelas... Lip balm. Não, é, o que que é? Aqui, lip balm. Um... É uma manteiga de cacau. É, Como cocoa manteiga? butter. É, lip balm, you can apply lip balm to your chapped lips. E, Bill, é, acho que foi o Caio que usou a palavra facilities, né? Que que você poderia explicar mais assim o que seria essa palavra? É, acho que foi quando ele estava contando a história é. do hostel que a que a menina ficava seguindo ele pelas facilities do hostel. Ah. Então facilities são ali os, os as instalações mesmo, né? As diferentes áreas ali do hostel. É. Então rec room, né? É, pub, restaurant, cafe são as facilities ali. É, posso só adicionar também? Acho que facilities é uma tem um um uso também que fica até estranho quando eu explico para os alunos que é você ter uma habilidade para alguma coisa, né? Você tem ah, facilities for languages, por exemplo. Isso. Né? Então, às vezes até quando eu, eu ensino os alunos... Nossa, Twitch, tá parecendo meio... Né? Embromation, é, né? É, tipo, você é, vem... Tipo, como fala, eu tenho facilidade, é, é facility, tá? Tá bajar em inglês, é. assim. Mas eu falo, não... Mas pessoal, é, tá certo tá mesmo. Tá certo, é. é. Mas é um pouco formal. É um pouco é. formal. É. As pessoas não é. usam muito... É. Bem, teve uma bem interessante aqui, inclusive é uma música bem legal, é Daydreaming. Daydreaming, que música é essa? É Harry Styles. Conheço. <risos> que também sou, tem um sotaque bem interessante sou, sou aqui velho, pra gente sim, falar. Sim, sou velho, eu não conheço. Bom, Daydreaming é ficar viajando, ficar brisando, sabe? Aquela, aquela pessoa que fica na aula assim, ó. E às vezes é o professor é, também, é, não tô brincando. É, a gente tá assim por cima. Daydreaming, é sonhar acordar. Ah, eu, eu tava daydreaming, o Bill, Bill tá falando. A hora que eu sou letrei aqui, eu é, falei, eu tava, é, tá certo? Tava ele olhando pra sei, camiseta é. dele, né? Ah, mas só é, tá bonito, certo. hein? Eu, não sei. Eu, eu, eu não sei só letrar Lester, essas palavras pra mim. Eu seria um, um assim, essas competições spelling bee. Bom, eu seria um. É, cara, eu sou é, muito ruim. Não poderia ser jurado, assim, o um juiz, sei lá. Muito ruim. <risos> Marcel, tem mais um legal que acho que foi você mesmo que usou: é Melting Pot. Você melting falou pot. que né, Londres, né? É o é. melting pot. É tipo, assim, traduzindo bem é. a forma, assim, é o, é o caldeirão cultural. Imagina você tá num caldeirão, você taca todos os ingredientes lá, mistura tudo. Então, você pensa, assim, cidades como é, Londres, Nova York, São Paulo, né? A gente esquece Com São certeza. Paulo. Pessoas do mundo inteiro, diversas culturas, religiões, né? É, que eu vejo como uma coisa positiva, né? Então, Sim. esse é um melting certeza. pot. Pra mim, é um... É um é um privilégio morar numa cidade com, né, com que seja um melting pot de culturas e tudo junto e misturado, tudo junto. Tudo e junto. Misturado. Esse pedaço que a gente está, inclusive a gente está aqui em Perdizes, né? Essa parte aqui da zona oeste é um melting pot, tem várias etnias aqui, sim, é muito sim. legal esses bairros em volta, né? Sim, é. Tem bastante coisa. É. 
Hints of English. Hints of British English. Hints. Cara, eu gostei você... muito quando você usou isso aí, porque eu tava com medo, como eu já tinha preparado pra destruir quem fala My English is American, eu tava com medo de você falar, não, yeah, because você I have British. Ah, eu tô brincando, viu, gente? Eu tô brincando, gente. Eu tô brincando, eu tô brincando. Eu só queria assim, peraí, né? Tone down, take it down a notch. É, mas é cinco episódios, vai estar o Bill desafiando o Popó pra... É, é, é. De box, uma briga de box, uma luta de box, né? É que a gente gosta tanto desses esportes que a gente não sabe nem falar, né? Se é luta, se é briga. briga de mas box. é o seguinte: é, então eu tava com muito medo de você falar, yeah, because I have British English, mas você. You definitely have lots of hints of British English. Ou seja, tem elementos ali. Nota. Tem uma pintada. Notas. Notas, é, eu percebo notas ali de Liverpool, de. Não, mas é. Hint, só uma coisa, a gente não usou nesse contexto, mas hint pode ser indireta também. Muita gente pergunta isso. Dica, né? Dica também. Ah, sim, é. é, é. Aí eu acho que é o uso mais é. comum, né? De uma mesa assim, indireta. Tem gente, aquela indireta. Hint. Muito bem. Então, no episódio de hoje, nós falamos sobre diferentes é, sotaques, né? Diferentes accents in English. Nós falamos das origens dos, dos accents, né? Dos sotaques, né? A gente explicou que não existe, né? Um sotaque padrão, né? Um sotaque inglês padrão, um sotaque americano padrão, né? Uh, nós falamos dos desafios, né? Da gente lidar com diferentes sotaques, a importância cultural que o sotaques é, Tra tra traduzem, né? Uhum. É, contamos algumas histórias engraçadas, ou nem tanto. <risos> Trágicas. Sobre... Ou trágicas, né? Sobre nossas experiências pessoais aqui, né? E compartilhamos algumas dicas com os nossos alunos, para com os nossos alunos, né? Sobre como lidar com esse desafio. E também de músicas e séries para você ter essa exposição a diferentes sotaques ao redor do mundo. Muito bem. Se você gostou desse episódio, não deixa de dar um like, ativar o sininho para saber quando o próximo episódio sai. Deixa seu comentário aqui para saber se você está gostando ou não. Segue o nosso canal e mostra esse vídeo aqui para um amigo seu que sempre quis estudar na cultura e achava, pô, a cultura inglesa não é para mim, que ele só ensina um inglês britânico, eu acho chato, não gosto. Vamos quebrar. Esse paradigma aí. Só gramática, né? É, ou é só, só, gramática, só gramática, né? Os professores são sérios, né? Tipo, não é gente aqui, né? É, mostra o episódio para os seus colegas, para os seus colegas de sala também. E é isso aí. Once again, thank you very much, Marcel. Guys, always a pleasure. Ok? Always a pleasure. On the bottom of my heart. And uh, I hope we can do... Uh, other episodes in the future. Please. Yes. Please. It will be not only a pleasure, but an honor. Muito obrigado a todos. Pessoal da 121 Studio, toda a equipe técnica. Vejo vocês no próximo episódio, pessoal.